of best laid plans of mice and men. Now, all this time, I've never ever reviewed a Spinosaurus. I've also never planned my videos ahead of time. A while ago, I decided to do both. I wanted to review a few Spinosauruses in a sequence that followed the evolution of its many revisions. Now, sadly, a couple of Spinosaurus figures have been indefinitely delayed, and I got a hold of this one, which would have made a nice end cap to the series. So rather than wait god knows how long for those two to arrive, I thought let's just get started with this one. Now, most people know about the exciting changes Spinosaurus has undergone, especially since Dr. Ibrahim's paper in 2014, suggesting that Spinosaurus was more quadrupedal than bipedal and adapted to aquatic life on a scale hitherto undreamt of. Did you seriously just say hitherto undreamt of? Yes, hitherto undreamt of. Out came Collecte, Johnny on the spot as usual, with its new version of Spinosaurus and a crocodilian tail. Others quickly followed, taking a cue from Collecte, with only Peppo bucking the trend with a fish or eel-like tail. Well, fast forward to 2020 with another Ibrahim paper revealing how the tail actually looked like. So, who would be the new Johnny on the spot to reflect this? Well, that's where my MIA model comes in. But surprisingly, next in line was not Collecte, as I'd expect, but PNSO. This is the Essien, the 2020 Spinosaurus. Yes, 2020, because PNSO has done another Essien. This beauty. Well, this one is an update, but it's a much smaller scale. And measured with the string, it's about 30 centimeters or 12 inches long. Now, taking an average estimate of 50 meters, which is about 49, 50 feet, that would make this a 1 to 50th scale. Strangely, the main feature of Spinosaurus this time isn't the sail, but that newly revised tail. And I want to talk a little bit about that, so please bear with me. Now, I'll talk about the profile, the muscle bulk, and the curvature. Now, first of all, the profile. And PNSO has done a marvellous job. I know, what a shock, right? As you can see, the form matches exactly as you see in the Ibrahim 2020 paper. The main body formed over the centre tapers down, while the height of the neural spines get proportionately longer and dominate towards the tip. Essentially, the further down you go, the less tail and the more sail or fin. You also have this very obvious kink, uh, which I believe is around the CA4 area, and there's something really pleasing about how closely PNSO has mirrored this. Second, the muscle bulk. You can see the proposed changes in muscle volume down the tail, and indeed, that's represented here as well. As you go down, the tail tapers medial laterally. And finally, the curvature. The paper proposes that due to the way the zygopophysis, which are bony projections on the vertebrae, now because of the way they change their structure and degree of overlap down the tail, the tail was highly flexible, especially for lateral movement. Um, it'd really be easier to explain this if, if only I had a spinal model lying around. Oh, here's one. Now, you see these overlapping projections? If we ignore ligaments, discs, and other confounding structures, the range and degree of movement possible at each joint is limited by their shape and their degree of overlap. So for example, here in our lumbar spine, with this configuration, you can't rotate too far because of the abutment. But you can bend forwards, and you can bend backwards. Well, the paper suggests that the Z-joint morphology in the tail allows for great lateral movement, implying, of course, sculling through the waters. However, Dr. Mark Witten identified a problem with that. With just a little lateral flexion, the spinous processes would displace so much further relatively that if it were to try sculling like a crocodile, the fin would tear. Now, I leave it to the experts to get that all sorted out. But the sculpt certainly seems to recognize that because you can see that um, the spinous 
sail doesn't exactly parallel the body of the tail but especially if you view it from this angle you can see a kind of twist so I really like that they recognize this that not everything will displace in parallel moving on the incredible detail now obviously there are scales plenty of different shapes and sizes um, the pattern here isn't all neat parallel rows as typically depicted but rather in picture imperfect arrays are creating such a real organic feel I mean if you were, if you were to look at the, uh, the scales of any lizard you'll see that this is more the case now complementing that detail is the color application as you can see there are four main layers formed from the very dark brown all the way to the very light and across all this you have the accents provided by these markings also painted very well um, they're not obviously sitting on the skin but appear to be pigmentation under it just look at the subtlety of color there it's so it's just wondrous to behold uh, notice also the ribbed appearance here formed by um, a pattern of larger scales that overlie the spinous processes all the way down here Tail. and uh, on the other side you see the same thing finally you have a fringe of dark gold on the upper margin created by yet a separate series of osteoderms what a nice cap off for the main event of the model and since we're here we might as well continue upwards to what would normally be the star feature of Spinosaurus the sail now you can see the fringing osteoderms continue to outline the entire top of the sail. As for the sail, it sports the same two-peak design popularized by Ibrahim and colleagues. As should be expected, the sail isn't given short shrift just because this time it's not the star. You'll see once again the beautiful paint job, how these markings just fade so naturally into the rest of the sail skin and these softly painted shades and fades are just delightful just looks so natural and just like in the tail the scales overlying the neural spines are enlarged and between them also the same but more minute giving it an almost veiny insect wing appearance and i absolutely love that design now at the base of each neural spine is a large and yet understated osteoderm uh, you'll see it a bit more obviously on the other side here and faithfulness to the paper is not just for the tail if you look at this reconstruction it's as if pnso matched it neural spine by neural spine uh, going up here uh, to the plateau of the uh, first peak I count spines 5 and 6 and just like in the diagram the valley formed by 3 more with the fourth being the next peak and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 spinous processes down it's nuts the degree of faithfulness PNSO put into this now down the body you can see yet detail after detail um, the osteoderms down the body up here uh, which continue down the tail on the other side you can see that yet more osteoderms here and I like how these osteoderms are all so subdued um, you'd have to really look close to appreciate they're even there you can even see belly veins here it gives me the impression that each scale was lovingly sculpted one by one given individual attention the paint job is again built up to create pigmentation layers and the smoothness of the blending it's like the same team did this and the Pachy Rhinosaurus we just reviewed I also love the way that uh, this pattern down here down on the tie um, and continuing up here and down the tail uh, gives me the impression of tiger stripes the pest seems to follow closely with the reconstruction in the 2014 paper and they are webbed 
as some have suggested they might be, which is a very nice touch. Now I don't believe any Spinosaurus hands have actually been found, so the hands are modelled usually from other Spinosaurus like Baryonyx. The claws are just massive. Now delightfully, unlike some models, there's no forced wrist pronation. The hands are held in a natural, neutral way. And on the right, he's clearly supported on his knuckles, with these claws safely protected. And on the left, I'm sure that this isn't to show him resting on his nails, but rather a hand in mid-stride, although in our world, they are of course supporting the model. Now, this choice to make him a knuckle walker seems to endorse Spinosaurus as an obligate quadruped, unlike the original where you feel that the, they were perhaps trying to hedge their bets a little and you feel that the hands play a more facultative role. Finally, we get to the head. Now, commenting on detail, scales and colour would just be repeating myself. Suffice it to say, you can see that it looks great. The skull looks right to me with that crocodilian nod. And surprisingly, on this small scale, the jaw articulates. And I guess all the better to appreciate the interlocking nature between the teeth in the lower jaw and the very distinctive subnarial gap here. Like a real fish trap. The teeth are individually sculpted and painted and there even appears to be hints of a gum line for these ones here. And a throat pouch uh, enhances the fish eater idea and of course with great detail. Now I've had to get used to how far back Spinosaurus eyes actually were but from the top they do look a little bit too close and too dorsal. Uh, giving the impression of the very soft fish um, Spinosaurus was supposed to have preyed on. Convergent evolution for a similar habitat? Well, one of you experts, please comment if this looks right to you. Finally, I like to compare PNSO models with the release images. Now, by and large, I'm pleased that they look very, very similar. There are subtle differences, for example, the, the much lighter patches here uh, on the flanks the underside of the tail and even on the sail. Uh, that, that gives it a nicer contrast, I think. Though on the other side of the, of the model, you'll see that uh, these patches look a lot closer. But really, I'm not sure if it's due to lighting differences, which um, you can't really avoid. Now on the sail, you also lose some subtlety in the marginal osteoderms. You can see the rib osteoderms here um, have more variations in layering and colour and I really wish we'd kept some of the black wash here on these osteoderms and same with the tail down here. But really it's so close that especially at this scale, this shortfall isn't anywhere as egregious as it would be on a larger scale model. There's nothing here that would enrage you. So, is this the most accurate Spinosaurus reconstruction yet? Actually, to muddy the waters, there are now suggestions that Spinosaurus may in fact be a biped after all. Now, this involves things like the volume of the tail and where the center of gravity might then change because of that. But the evidence does seem to lean towards facultative quadrupedality. Time will tell. For now, I believe this to be the most accurate figure out there. Again, I'm speaking as a self-learner who's got a lot to learn. And I hope that when even more comes to light, PNSO will do a 1 to 35th scale revision down the road. Well, that's it for now. It was a bit longer review today, uh, but there was just so much to say about this model. I might have a couple of dinos coming in. I'm not sure if I'll review them, but but I don't want to neglect my dragon fans too much. So very soon, I might just have something for you.